we need to, we're waiting for the uh, slides to refresh. Uh, so. Oh, wait, which slides are you referring to? The that, no. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll make sure that we get those. If they haven't, I'll make sure Christy knows about that. You, so you submitted them as a request? Oh, okay. Yeah, just put it in as a request and, uh, you know, on the meeting materials and we'll approve them and that way I can share them easily. <clears throat> Uh, Ted, yes, I was uh, speaking to Lars off mic, so I will be more careful about aiming to the mic when I mean to speak. There you go. Thank you. All right, it is about that time or three minutes past. With any such luck, we have slides. Yay, slides. All right, welcome to uh, Gen Dispatch for ITF 114. Um, I am Pete Resnick. Kirsty Payne is out in uh, remote land for this particular one. Hi, everyone. I'm here, just an ephemeral voice. Pete's going to obviously lead most of the session. Thanks, Pete. Uh, so Kirsty will be taking notes. I posted the uh, notes URL in the chat. Please go and join her if you would and fill in any details. If you hear them that she does not, that's always helpful. <coughs> and we have the note well. Uh, you should all by Wednesday know this stuff, but by participating here, you are agreeing to the IETF policies and procedures. If you do not know them, please go review them. There's a list of BCPs at the bottom of this slide. You need to be aware that by participating, there are lots of rules regarding uh, patents and patent applications that are controlled or owned by you or your sponsor, and you're going to have to disclose such patents if those become at issue. If you don't want to do that, you should probably not participate. You may have your photograph taken. Uh, personal information may be shared according to the IETF privacy statement. And that as a participant, you agree to work respectfully with other 
with other participants and abide by our anti-harassment and code of conduct policies. Which is what I just said there. Um, we're trying to create and maintain an environment in which people of many different backgrounds are treated with dignity, decency, and respect. And so you're expected to behave according to professional standards and demonstrate appropriate workplace behavior. Don't engage with harassment. I happen to be a member of the ombuds team. If you have issues with harassment, please do not feel shy about contacting us. If you are in the room, uh, physically here, please do either use the QR code there or find the agenda page and please do log into the light meet echo session at least. You may use the full meet echo session if you like. For everybody remote, they will have done so already. Uh, but that way you can put yourself in the queue for raising hands and then you become part of the blue sheets. Please do that. If you are remote, please make sure to use headphones and mute yourself appropriately in between speaking and not, and try not to turn on your video unless you are speaking. Bunch of links. Uh, if you look at the meeting materials link on the agenda page, you can download this stuff and find all the documents we're using and uh, contact either of your chairs. One mention with regard to chairs, which we did not put in the slides, as you may have noticed on the mailing list because of other things, in particular, Lars punishing me by getting me to volunteer for RSWG, I will be stepping down as chair. I think Kirsty would very much appreciate a co-chair. If you are at all interested in possibly co-chairing Gen Dispatch, please send email to Lars. I will stay on until we find a replacement, but not for too long. Um, so please get your name into Lars. Uh, help would be very much appreciated. A reminder of the Gen Dispatch process. Gen Dispatch recommends next steps for new work. I hear some noises in the background. Is that okay? Just checking. Um, Gen Dispatch recommends next steps for new work. We do not adopt drafts ourselves. We do not do work on drafts in this room except to discuss them slightly so we understand how to dispatch them. The possible outcomes include directing to an existing working group, proposing a new focused working group, asking for AD sponsorship if the AD in question is willing and able, additional discussion or community development might be required and we might ask for that before further dispatch, or we might decide to dispatch to the trash can as in the IETF should not take on this topic. Please, when you get up to the mic, state your name. I will try and remember to introduce you from the queue list, but if I do not, please do state your name. Keep the dispatch questions in mind when you make your comments. Um, we don't need to comment on the direct, uh, uh, you know, nits and pieces of the proposal, but whether we should do something with it, and if so, what? and please keep your comments uh, reasonably brief. We don't have a very long session. If you are remote, please remember when you, you join the queue, when you are called on, please turn on your mic and if you like video. So here is our rather short and easy agenda. Oh, which didn't refresh. Oh, well, um, we'll get there. Um, first, well, that was our administrative part. Um, Lars is going to talk to updating the DAO. Then we're going to have some discussion about NOMCAM eligibility, but Martin won't be doing that. I will, uh, because we, th there have been some changes afoot even this week on that topic. And then we'll have a conclusion and summarize what we need to summarize. Any further things? If there is time at the end, obviously, we'll have other business if people want to bring it up. Are there any agenda bashes that need to happen? The stairs into your computer screens are delightful. Um, then the next step will be, let me get Lars's slides up. Uh, 
there we go. Just tell me when to move to the next one. Or actually, you can do that from your phone, can't you? Uh, but I could do it. That's fine. This was off. Now it's on. Uh, my name is Lars Eggert, and uh, I'm the ITF chair in the general area ID, and I have two topics. Um, first of one is uh, how we're going to go about updating the DAO in the future. The DAO used to be an RFC. Can you go, go next slide? The DAO. So the, the screen down here has a curtain that makes you can't read the corners, which is kind of cute. Um, so the, the DAO was published as an RFC up until 2006, I guess. Um, there have been five, thank you, five uh, revisions, um, six revisions at a time. Um, and then we decided that that was too heavyweight a process. Um, and instead, we decided we're going to publish it as a web page. And we published RFC 6722 to describe how we're going to do that. And uh, the intent was to have more rapid updates to the DAO. Um, and that started out well in 2012. We had three revisions, um, but then it sort of slowed again. And by now, we've had done two more. Um, so if you look at the, the counts, um, not significantly um, improved our rate of updates to the DAO. And so this is sort of an opportunity for a different process, I think. Um, but it's also the opportunity for a broader discussion about maybe what do we want the DAO to be. Next slide. So there's a bunch of processes with um, what 6722 says uh, we should do. And, and I'm gonna, I put them in an email a while ago. I'm gonna list them here. But first, um, although the DAO is published as a web page now, uh, revisions still require ISG approval. Um, and the ISG reviews and approves many documents, um, and we use the data tracker for that. But the DAO revisions don't live in the data tracker. So they're really hard to track and approve in a timely manner if you overload it, like we all are. Um, and it, it would be overkill, I think, to add bespoke tooling to the data tracker just to deal with DAO revisions. Um, and Craig asked questions to the community is, does the ISG really need to review these DAO revisions? Would it be better or easier if somebody else did so? We'll see. Next slide. Another problem is that old DAO revisions are still available as RFCs because we never changed them and unpublished them. And that means they get indexed by search engines and people cite them because people like to cite proper documents over web pages, especially like when they write um, articles and uh, Things. And so, you know, these old revisions don't seem to die, uh, which is a little bit of a problem because the contents of the DAO change. Next slide. And then RFC 6722 is pretty prescriptive. You probably can't read this, but there's some text in section two that sort of talks about the specific URLs where the DAO lives and revisions that are under review shall live. Um, it has a process that again includes some URLs. Um, and instructs the ISG exactly how it needs to sort of go about uh, publishing updates. Um, and then it also talks about how you archive the DAO. And again, it's the URL scheme. So that seems, it might have made sense at the time we published this 10 years ago. These days, it sort of restricts us a little bit in how we run the web front end. So um, we might want to change that and give uh, the operations people a bit more flexibility. Next slide. So personal view uh, for what we could do here, right? And basically that there's sort of two broad categories in my mind. If there's a desire um, that the ISG continue review DAO revisions, it would be awfully nice if we could like publish them as RFCs again so we can use the regular process in the data tracker to manage that review and approval. If we decide that we wanna do something else, not to require the ISG to approve these, I don't really care what we do, but it gives us a lot more options, right? And that's basically where I'm going to stop to have a discussion. Thank you. Stefan. Stefan Wenger, my first observation is that these two things are uh, not mutually exclusive. For example, you could decide that every three years you publish an RFC perhaps even on a fixed schedule, and that RFC could say, oh, and by the way, for updates, go to this web page. Dave Skenazi. Dave Skenazi, 
document enthusiast, I guess. Um, so first point, yes, I'm somewhat horrified to see in 2021 HTTP only URLs, like some point, like, yeah, my browser is about to stop allowing those at some point. So yeah, that's being this prescriptive makes absolutely no sense in this day and age. So I fully agree with you, Lars. That's some, that doesn't need to be this strictly specified. Like no one's gonna actually follow your, like the, no one discovers the DAO by looking at an RFC that tells you what the process for the DAO is. If someone's doing that, they're not the target audience of the DAO. Um, but then my second point is on this, discoverability and target audience. I kind of think of the DAO as the decoder ring of the ITF, the read this and you'll understand what the hell all these words mean and why these people are so strange. But um, then I'm very confused because I don't know much about Taoism and why is our decoder ring has a name that needs to be decoded itself. It would be nice if we had this like front and center on with a name that is useful, that people can understand what it is. I know that the DAO was a cute name back in the day, but if our goal of this document is to help newcomers understand how we are, maybe a rename could be useful. Barry Liba is up. This is Barry Liba and my, uh, now after David's, uh comment, mine can be very Could short. Move a bit closer to the mic, please. Now that uh, David has spoken, mine can be very short. I agree with that last bit of David's, that we should be targeting this to beginners at the IETF and uh, focus it differently. Jim Reed. Thank you very much, Pete. Jim Reed. Um, I think we need to keep publishing this as an RFC, um, because as you said, Lars, this is how people make reference to the style of documents and so on. I think it would be icky if we ended up having that being referenced through a URL or something like that. I'm also not keen on the idea of sticking stuff in GitHub. As far as the review process is concerned, I agree an IESG review is overkill. So I would maybe suggest that the chair of the IETF does that. That's why you get the big bucks, isn't it? I didn't catch the last part. <laughs> is that the, IET, the IETF chair could do the review on, on their own. That's why you get the big bucks, Lars. So, so if, it's, if it's supposed to be an RFC on the IETF stream, it, it needs to go through ISG approval. There's no other way to publish RFCs on the IETF stream. We decided long ago that that's the way we're going to do it. Uh, Karen O'Donoghue. Uh, j just a quick reference on discoverability. <clears throat> It's on the newcomers page, it goes out an email to all of the newcomers and it's in the newcomers tutorial. So it is actually sent to newcomers for what that's worth. Uh, Rob Welton, you're next in line. Uh, Rob Welton, Cisco. So I don't think the ISG needs Get to close review. To the mic. I, I don't think the ISG needs to review this, I think that's overkill. I would personally like to see this on GitHub and published just as a web page. And I think it's again, the comments that Barry and others have made that the focus of this should be to newcomers. And I think trying to target this or even a collection of pages more towards that is better. I, I find this hard to read. I didn't read all of this when I came to the ITF and I've managed, I know, I know other people have done the same thing. All right, uh, Ecker, you're next. Yeah, I guess I'd like to disentangle two questions. Um, one, what we have to provide to newcomers and two, what the fate of this artifact ought to be. Um, this artifact is not appropriate for the current era. Let me just put it that way. Like when people come, people, the way people come to organizations now is they expect to have information presented in a layered format where the initial page, where the initial page that is easy to read and then you can go dive deeper and that's like how the web works now. And so like the idea that they're gonna wade through like pages and pages of like asking narrative with, you know, with like history of like the arcana, arcana of the ITF that they don't need to understand to do anything at all, like many fine lunches and dinners. It's like, I understand people are attached to our history and like for the DAO to continue to like document those historical arcana and our history, like is a fantastic, is like, is like good. I've read John Peterson's books on d and I enjoy them. This can serve that same purpose, but for the purpose of bringing in newcomers doing something else. And so I'd like to decouple those two questions. I think it's fine for the DAO to continue to be an, uh, something that is published by published in RFC and that is reviewed by the ISG and people who think that that kind of history is important or attached to it and feel, and feel like that's an important thing to work on should continue to do so. But we should produce a separate set of artifacts which are targeted at newcomers that bring them up to speed quickly in the way that people now expect. And like 
that is web pages, it's videos, it's tutorials, it's like all the material that you go if you like, if you want to learn how to use like, you know, if you want to learn how to like deploy something on Cloudflare or Fastly, like that, or like learn how to write node code, right? There's like tutorials you can read that, and that's the kind of stuff material you need. And we should like engage people on how to write the material, and we should put it out on our website. Thanks, uh, Don Eastlake, you're up. Uh, hi, Don Eastlake from uh, Futureway Technologies. Uh, I guess I wanted to uh, endorse uh, at least periodic uh, publication as an RFC, and uh, I don't know, I'm fine with reorganizing things so that it's more top down and uh, has uh, less discursive stuff throughout, but and the more of the stuff you need most urgently near the beginning of the document and stuff, and uh, things like that. But I, I'm in favor of uh, solid, uh, permanent written documentation, and uh, maybe uh, people who are, are likely to be successful in the IETF uh, can absorb that kind of stuff. Hang on, I've got a follow-up question to you, and, and sure. there was also somebody else who had the same idea. So can we talk a little bit how that would work in practice, right? So if you'd like, say, do an RFC every three years, would we then, in the meantime, allow the editors to push things to the web page without review by the ISG? And then uh, it it, after three years, the ISG reviews, and what if, what if the ISG disagrees? <laughs> and well, ho hopefully after three years, the IETF reviews uh, going through the ISG. But uh, I, I think that uh, maybe this working group to review, I don't know. Somebody else can review in the meantime. The Gen dispatch isn't chartered for that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you can always change that. <laughs> I'm not gonna. We will do nothing except this one thing. Or a new working group. Thanks, Don. Uh, Dave Skenazi again. This is me again, uh, web enthusiast. Um, now, first, I really want to agree with Ecker. Uh, like, I brought uh, three new, three newcomers with me to this meeting. Uh, I didn't tell them to read the DAO first, because like Ecker says, it is somewhat unscrutable. Um, so having a better format that is what people expect is what we should do, because we should meet people where they are. Uh, if we are looking to have more newcomers, which I personally believe we are. Um, so that said, if some folks feel strongly that this should be an RFC, well, the, the correct solution would be a mutable RFC, but uh, I'll avoid the third rail over there. Um, then, yeah, just have a thing that takes the website, turns it into text, and then have the ISC publish it at once a year. Like, get rid of as much process as you can. We already spent our, enough to, of our wheels and our time navel gazing over here. And, you know, just having someone do it as opposed to spending hours and hours sounds like the right path forward. I'd rather all of that time and energy be spent on making better tutorials for newcomers. Thanks. And I'm going to close the queue in just a moment. So please add yourself now if you want to get on the, uh, the bandwagon here. Uh, we should have plenty of time. A Andrew, uh, can't we? Uh, yeah, so just pick up another and, and tip the mic down a bit towards your mouth. Sorry, is that better? Yes, thanks. Yeah, so pick up on a number of points. I, I agree, I think, with what Eka said uh, about the naming and so on. Uh, that could usefully do be modernized to make it more obvious what it's actually for. The process seems uh, not fit for purpose. However, looking at the stats on the slide, it's only been updated three uh, five times in a decade. Is that because of the process, or is it because actually there was no need to update it anyway? Um, so, to be honest, if it only needed to be updated five times, the process is almost irrelevant, um, even though it does feel not fit for purpose. Um, assuming that it would be updated more frequently if the process was different, then sort of tying it back to an RFC, maybe updated every three years to catch up. Um, but empowering someone to sort of, sort of manage the, the, the page in the meantime would seem like a, a good way of doing it. Um, um, and maybe, since it's mainly for newcomers, I'd suggest perhaps uh, uh, putting it under the responsibility of Emodir as a working group um, to uh, just keep oversight uh, of the content 
in, in the intervening three years would seem yeah, so a, a good solution. I didn't say that on the slides. There is an editor team for the DAO that is sort of maintaining it and, and they are at least sort of cross-reviewing each other's changes. And I think it's been done on GitHub now uh, in a way that isn't <laughs> congruent with 6722, but that also allows the community to see the proposed changes and, and weigh in it. And I think recently that ha has happened more frequently. So we have that team and I, I didn't mention that. Yeah, there's a whole separate conversation about GitHub, but maybe that's for another place. Um, Miria, you're next in the queue. Yeah, Mia Kulevin. So actually one point I wanted to make is about this, like is there a need to update? And yes, there is a need because it outdates very quickly. There's things that are changing and just like not correct anymore. But on the other hand, no, there's no need because it doesn't seem anybody actually cares about it. So, um, and, and like this is really not the right document for newcomers. There's very little information that's helpful for newcomers. When I was a newcomer, the only information that I got out of this is that I don't have to wear a suit, which was very helpful, but <laughs> it's a very long document for that. And I, I agree with Eckhart, it's not in the right format that like the information is easy accessible. So this idea, this is for newcomers, we should just like completely forget about it. So what's the, what's the DAO for? Um, I don't know. I'm like, I also feel sad about just getting rid of it because it's part of our tradition, it's part of our culture. But on the other hand, we will never get rid of it because it's, it's published as an RFC and even if it's, if it's like historic or deleted or whatever, it will be around, people keep reading it. So it will be there forever. I think we should just do nothing and forget about it. And not being able to get rid of stuff is also part of our culture. Sure. <laughs> uh, and, and just to say, Georgius, you don't have to stand there. You can't take one of the seats. We'll, we'll call, I, I swear I'll call. <laughs> uh, Jim Fenton, you're up next. Hi, Jim Fenton. Uh, I think there's actually at least two issues here. One is the the structure of the document, or what it says, and and um, you know, is it like one long piece of text like it is currently, or do we break it up into pieces, or somehow make it uh, friendlier and easier? I think Ecker had a lot of great points on that. And then there's the other question of how we do uh, uh, configuration control on it. Uh, it. It seems to me like something GitHub or something of that sort is very well suited to doing this you you, you keep the history you, it it accommodates you know breaking it up into a bunch of pieces that link to each other and so forth so uh, i would i would recommend that we might possibly want to publish one more rfc that uh just you know supersedes or or you know uh updates the uh, the the uh, latest one that was published that says go look go look here instead of in, in instead of for this text directly uh, just so that we have something that people can reference. Although, honestly, I think we should be focusing on trying to uh, make the, the the document as useful as possible to participants. And if somebody wants to reference it, fine, but I don't think we should really have to focus on that. DKG. Um. Hi, uh, I want to echo what everybody else is saying about this not being appropriate for newcomers for the class of basically all newcomers who might come to the ITF. I read the DAO when I started coming here. Uh, you know, I thought it was interesting, but people shouldn't have to. There was a comment made earlier that people who don't have the time or the patience to read this kind of document won't do well at the IETF, which makes it sound like this is some sort of hazing ritual. And uh, uh, I, don't, I don't like hazing. I think, I mean, I, I enjoyed reading it myself, but I don't like hazing. And um, I, I have to agree with Jim that we should publish a, a tombstone that points towards something that Emodur can keep up to date that's actually focused towards the tasks that newcomers want to do and is indexed in a way that's accessible to people who are not uh, graybeards. Jay, it's so good that you're vertical enough to join us. You're up. Go right ahead. Thank you. Um, not actually vertical. <coughs> um, so no, I <laughs> pretty much agree with Miria and Eka and others that uh, a lot of work went into this document. It was marvelous in its time, but that time I think possibly passed 10 years ago. Um, that just to break down some of the problems with it, because I think people may not necessarily understand it. The tone, it, the way it's written, you the newcomer, is actually quite divisive in that. Um, it's full of things that say, you might think this, but no, actually, we do this, um, which makes me want to run to reach out and, you know, each time I hear that one. Um, it's strangely enough, it's a reference from some stuff that is nowhere else. It's the only place that tells us how, what the dots are on people's badges. Um, 
it's got a very odd set of contents when you read it. It's reasonably unbalanced in some ways. Um, and it's got a lot of folklore in it. So I, I think that we, as Eka said, we need to take a very different approach that is multi-layered. I would not want to lose what people think is important in here, the folklore and other things. And I would not want to lose the community input into these things. Those are vital. So whatever structures we create going forwards are useful, but basic well, newcomers guides and taking things forward, I, I would, I, I, to be entirely honest with you, I cringe whenever we tell a newcomer to look at the Dow. It's going to put them off more than it's actually going to help them. And so I'd really like us to take a different approach there. Thanks and, and feel better. Uh, Martin Duke. Uh, Martin Duke, Google, and enthusiast for the uh, IESG having less work, <laughs> um, self-interestedly. Uh, so number one, plus one to the uh, keep it as a cultural artifact. Don't use it for newcomers. Um, but the, the, two, the two, I think, new points I'd like to make is, um, number one, I don't think it's an actual like metric how frequently this is updated. And it's not a problem that hasn't been updated in, in X years. If it's fine, it's fine, especially if it's just a cultural artifact. And the second thing is um, regarding IESG review, like it's an informational document, so you just need one yes ballot to make it to to move it forward. So it's, I mean, as an ISG member, uh, I wouldn't necessarily feel compelled to review this document if I didn't care, um, which is, I guess, the status quo of which is the case for either like not RFC versus RFC. And given your points about just the ease of using the data tracker and all that. Why not make it an RFC um, just to just to simplify the paperwork without actually causing any more work for the IESG? Thanks. Georgios. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, uh, sorry for staying in the in the queue. No, uh, your comfort, not yeah. mine. Yeah, I have a, um, um, some ideas on uh, on what could happen. Um, for example, if you look at the IESGOs, there are article of associations that are very important for a certain uh, SDO. Uh, the DAO is not, has, is, you cannot consider it to be in the same uh, category, but uh, there are some topics like, uh, you know, the operation of the uh, work group and working group and uh, the chairs and all these things that are somehow formalizing the way of how uh, uh, the process in, in groups and the leadership of the groups are, uh, are doing so we, that. We have other documents, George, that specify those. Yeah, twenty-four, I, I, eighteen. Yes, but there are for some not. There are some. Uh, uh, if you look into, into some sections that are referring to some uh, websites, so I don't know. I mean, so and, that's and a, a little difference. closer to the mic, Georgios. They say they're having so, a hard time hearing you. Yeah, so there are two types of information. One that is inform informal for you know for newcomers, but other one uh, other information that is more formal. So I don't know if there is a way to to uh, to make the selection. And for the informal, you know, inform uh, for the information that is only uh, used, uh, you know, by uh, by newcomers. I don't know. I agree with uh, with Miria and uh, Jay. But for the formal one, we maybe we should think further about what, what should but happen. There, there isn't anything formal in this document because it's an informational document. So nothing in it carries any weight when it comes to the standards process. It might explain things slightly differently, but 2418 is the thing that, that matters when it comes to working groups and 2026, obviously, for the overall process. But, but I will point out that, as Jay said, the dots are only defined in this document, which is an odd thing. Right. They're also on the newcomers orientation slides. Okay, but I thought uh, by reading in that there is some, you know, some yeah. difference in information. That is Thanks. Uh, Wes, you're up. Yep. I, I find it interesting that a lot of people that aren't newcomers are standing up saying that the document's not useful because they're no longer newcomers to a large extent. <laughs> You know, there are oddities in it. I will say that it is too long. Uh, there are certainly, it could be trimmed. The fat could be, you know, trimmed. We could make it a better document. I think it's up to, you know, Emo Dur to figure out how to fix it. That being said, with my guide's hat on, we refer every newcomer to it. And we've had a lot of people saying it's a useful document. 
So, you know, I'm not, I, there seems to be a discrepancy between this, <laughs> between the people that have been around a long time saying whether it's useful and the newcomers that have told me, hey, that's a useful document, but it's, you know, too long. Um, I think a rewrite is definitely in order. Karen, is it waking up Karen? Karen, hello. I, I will say that I think one of the things we should do is on the Thursday newcomer feedback session, ask how many people read it and get their feedback on it. I think that would be valuable data and I think that we can take on, you know, doing that as well. But please don't get rid of it because I need something to point to. It's, it's, they need to at least some briefing material. And yes, there's training slides and that might be good too, but some document that people can read coming up, even if it's a whole lot shorter and a whole lot simpler, which would be a good thing, I need something to point to. Peter Thompson. Hi, it's Peter from DSEC. <clears throat> so essentially I agree with Wes and um, I'm quite new to the ITF. I, I would say, I don't know, a bit more than a year. And I did read the Tao and I did find it quite useful. Um, so I don't know, perhaps it could be a little bit more concise, but I don't, th I don't think that requires a change in format. Um, then the second uh, thing I wanted to say is that I also agree with what somebody else said, that frequency and change is not a good metric for whether the format is right <clears throat> or for whether the process of updating it is right. I think um, the frequency of uh, updates should correspond to how frequently we want to update it. And I don't know how often we want to update it. Perhaps there is, I take this off because my beard. <laughs> so um, if we want to update it, let's say th three times a year, and then we are not able to actually do that because of process, then of course the process has to change. But for example, it would also be possible to um, combine updates and only do it, I don't know, every two, three years, because I also don't think it's very important that it's completely up to date. I think things that change are mostly details. Um, and um, even if a bigger thing should change, let's say we change the AD structure or something, um, it's not so important for a newcomer to have that update immediately, I think. And um, yeah, then um, if people don't read it, um, I think it needs to be advertised better. I think that's true for all kinds of newcomer material. So let's say we replace this with something else. Let's say we have a um, video, you know, a set of tutorial videos on how the ITF works or something like that. Then people wouldn't consume that necessarily either. And it needs to be um, more prominent regardless of format. And if the, the problem is that people don't consume it, then we should um, make it more prominent. And if, if we're trying to gather data like Wes uh, suggested for um, who thinks it's a good thing of those who read it, we could also ask the other ones why they didn't read it. Perhaps they didn't see it or they did see it and it was too long or they did see it and they didn't care. And if they don't care, then perhaps they wouldn't care about other material too. Thanks, Stefan. So Stefan Wenger. Um, I just, uh, I dug through very, very, very old files of mine and uh, uh, I do a little bit of expert witness work on the site and I remembered vaguely that this was, that the version of the DAO was actually cited, yeah, um, uh, in a lawsuit and it, it's indeed true that was uh, the, the, what, 4677 version, yeah, the, so don't suspect that things that could be viewed as informal representation of process documents wouldn't be read by people who may have an agenda that's adverse to your employer's agenda, for example, and wouldn't be interpreted in a way that's adverse. So I'm saying that for two reasons. One reason, obviously, if we are, if we are not maintaining this as an RFC, we need a tombstone. I mean, that's, that's a no-brainer. But the other reason is, don't take this thing lightly as um, it's for the newcomers, blah, blah, blah. No, it's not. Yeah? The people who litigate this type of stuff are kind of newcomers too. And they put a lot of weight on, or at least in one case that I witnessed myself, they have put a little bit of weight on this. Thank you. All right, Sam, you get the last word from the floor. Sam Weiler, not a newcomer. Lars, thank you for the well-formulated questions. I heard some suggestions here that I really don't like, namely that of snapshotting the updates as RFCs, because I never want to go looking for a document and find two versions that look like they might be the most current, right? the RFC and the actually current one. So I would say, please don't go back 
to the RFC stream if you can avoid it. I'm fine with saving the ISG the work. And if you need something less prescriptive than 6722 gives you, as I think you observed, you can ignore 6722 or go issue an update to it. But please don't give us multiple current appearing versions to confuse people. So, and I, I have been trying to absorb whether there is some consensus about what the dispatch answer here is. Um, I suspect that Kirsty and I will have to go circle back and review all of the comments and the notes in the chat room. Um, I mean, yeah, Kirsty says, uh, uh, you know, there, there is some indication that people are in favor of materials for newcomers, but not completely in agreement about what that what those should be. Um, I think we'll try and discuss offline for a bit and see if we can summarize this. Uh, do you have any further comments or did you get enough from that discussion? Want to see our summary first? I'd like to see your summary because I'm similarly confused at the moment. I need to read what was said. I, yeah. There wasn't any clear indication. On... I, there were lots of good suggestions of different things to do, but it didn't seem like we were circling toward one particular yeah. one. So maybe we have to boil down to a few sort of general suggestions and see where the group is pointing. The other thing we might try, and that we can do it in parallel, right, would basically ask the editors of the DAO to do a short, you know, half pager on what they would like to use as their process going forward, because they're actually doing the work. And and if that manages to, you know, capture consensus, then we're done. Yeah. That doesn't seem unreasonable to me. Okay. Um, right. I think you. we have some work to do as, as chairs, and then we'll get back to the group. Thank you. That's uh, been good input. So let me do a little refresh of the slides to make sure I have the most current and see if, oops. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, refresh, there we go. Off on chair slides. Okay. Look at that. Things are updated. All right. So going on to the NomCom eligibility uh, thing. Well, let, let me first summarize where what happened this week. So Martin Duke had uh, written up a draft and had some discussion about uh, plausible outcomes for changes to the NOMCOM eligibility. Uh, for those who don't know the issue, um, we have this experiment underway about dealing with remote participants and other uh, qualifications for people uh, to be um, on the NOMCOM. And of course, now that we've gone back to hybrid meetings and this is going on for some period of time, the question comes up, well, now we have to make adjustments to what we had said earlier. Um, there was some discussion back and forth earlier this week. A few people got together in a side meeting, chatted for a bit, and Lars uh, basically proposed that he would be happy with doing this as a working group, a quick spin up, spin down kind of working group that we've done in the past. And so the Dispatch question reduces more to, does anybody in the room think it's a bad idea for Lars to take that on? He would still like our input. Um, so Barry wrote up a um, quick charter proposal. And uh, you can see it here on the screen. I'll give you a bit to read it over. And we would like input on whether folks think this is a good thing to just toss off as a quick working group or have, you know, objections to such. 
consider the queue open for discussion. Uh, well, Ted's up there first, so we'll let Ted speak. Uh, howdy. I just point out that uh, right now we use the non-com eligibility as eligibility cr criteria also for recall committees. Uh, so I think we would have to clarify whether when something says only eligibility to volunteer for the non-com, we actually also mean all the other things that we use non-com eligibility as a signal for. Uh, or we're, whether we really mean uh, exactly this and only this. Uh, I personally think it would be quite odd to have one for the non-com and a different one for recall committees. Not that we've seen one in the wild, um, but uh, I think clarity would, would be welcome here. Uh, I do and think the dispatch sorry, question. <laughs> sorry, Another just to answer. Go ahead. Uh, the dispatch question, uh, a short-lived working group certainly seems like the right thing to do here. Sorry about that. I was just going to say, uh, if you didn't see it in the distance, Barry gave you a big thumbs up when you suggested the change. So um, anyway, uh, Ecker, you are next up in the queue. All right, just to add two things, just to add to the list of things it has to cover is also um, uh, recall signature eligibility, not just recall committee eligibility, um, which I think it should cover all of them. Um, because uh, I think they're the same, the same, it's the same essential electorate. Um, I think this is, this all seems fine. Um, ordinarily, I'd be here to like tell you that the 2011 was science fiction, but actually I think it's achievable in this case. Um, so, yeah. We've done a couple of really quick ones. But yes. yes. Um, and just responding to both of those, I, I knocked this together just before the working group chairs forum started in about three minutes. So, yes, I left that out and, and that needs to be tweaked. Uh, Dave. David Skenazi. Uh, plus one to everything that's been said. Thumbs up. Do it. Make it happen. Great. Thanks. Uh, Rich Sauls, you are up. Not up enough. Um, yeah. Okay. I'll, everyone else, it should happen. Um, it's got to happen really quickly because there will be data tracker changes and Robert's probably only got so much bandwidth to do them. And that's it. And for those who didn't notice Rich's orange dot, it's going to be his problem this year. So it would. Oh, you're done. Yes, you're. You're. Yes, you're. You're out of the loop now because you've already published the list. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, you're going to be on next year's, aren't you? Uh, yeah. So Lars, sorry, go right ahead. Yeah, Lars, I got. Um, I wanted to quickly get a sense of the the group whether we're comfortable with doing a bo a bothless working group. A fair question. Uh, I see at least thumbs up in the audience. Uh, does anybody want to raise a concern about that? Come to the mic. Put yourself in the queue. We could do a poll, but that, I saw enough hands go up. Uh, that's fine. And, and oh, Rand, Robert, and Russ both say no buff on the chat. And Olaf says plus one, go ahead. And Charter looks good. John says, uh, Martin, please go right ahead. Yes, uh, Martin Duke, Google. So I just would like to state for the record that I'm I'm happy to be the author of the product for this. Um, and for those of you who saw my Gen Dispatch draft, I'm by 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 mutual agreement in the side meeting, um, I will strip out the criteria changes and use the 8989 criteria as a baseline. Uh, so if there's any controversy, you can save that for the working group. <laughs> Thanks. Excellent. And by the looks of the uh, chat room. There, there is uncharacteristic happiness and agreement. So uh, I think we're doing well. Any other questions you have, Lars? Uh, no, not a question, but um, I'm also looking for chairs. I'm specifically interested in some former NOMCOM chairs that might want to serve again and that have significant cycles over the next six months because this will need to be kept on track. We could need an RFC before the next NOMCOM cycle. Right, uh, good point. Uh, Suresh, you wanted to make a comment. Volunteer. You're volunteering, aren't you, Suresh? He runs back. No, come on up. That's OK. Uh, Suresh Krishnan, so I just want to make sure, like I saw very your chart, right? I know it's quick. Uh, but I think it needs to talk about 8713 instead, right? Because the goal is to replace 8713 with this BCP. 
not to continue 18 and 89. So I just wanted to make that clear. It's like even reading the document, it was not like totally clear. That's what I was intending to do because I was trying to do a point update on 87.13, but this would be probably like a full rewrite of that, right? So thanks. Yeah, if Martin, if you want to just respond to that, go right ahead. So I'm by far, by, I'm far from an expert on this, but my understanding was that 8713 addresses a number of non-com issues and there's like a specific section like 414 that is about the eligibility. And so 88, 80, 89, 89. thank you, uh, specifically updates that, but as an ex, as experimental, as an ex so we essentially upgrade that to standard. We continue to update 8713. I Okay. Uh, I, I would point out that whether this updates a point in 87.13 or obsoletes or updates 89.89 to update that point in 87.13 seems like in the weeds of the process right. that we have to do. So with the, this moment. is Barry. I, I, I will take the action to adjust the charter text appropriately and we'll pass it back by the mailing list before we go further. So yeah. excellent. Um, Decker? Yes. I just meant to say I'm quite confident that like between Barry and Lars, they can sort out which things update so they're not. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Suresh, you had another uh, comment. No, like my concern was really, uh, we don't want to go back to the kind of thing where like the non-com stuff was strewn across multiple documents. Like I think like Barry kind of worked on it, like with Murray and Gang to kind of pull all these things together into one place. And I think we should try to kind of keep it all together so it's not hard for somebody to find these things. That was kind of why I wanted to push for that, like a full update rather than a Point of date. Uh, appreciated. Uh, and this is being discussed on eligibility discuss. Um, and, and I think that is the appropriate forum to hash out what the charter should say. Um, so yeah. Uh, Rich, go right ahead. Okay, if we're going to ha handle it on eligibility to discuss, that's great. But this is a real small minor update for changes in modern global conditions, like hybrid and remote. So I really would hate to see us open up the whole NOMCOM selection process, whole NOMCOM process document. I, I will read that as you recommend that the charter be very tightly scoped. <laughs> yeah, I, I, Martin Duke, uh, Google. Um, yeah, plus one and Rich, like 8713 covers a lot of stuff. And if our scope is simply eligibility, I don't think missing the whole thing is compatible with that. Uh, Suresh, did you want to follow up on? Yeah, no, I, I, I fully understand uh, Rich's concern and Martin's concern, right? Like, so uh, it's kind of hard to find, but I do understand, like, uh, but uh, one thing you've done is like kind of keep only this thing open for comment. Like, that's probably a way to do it, but I do understand the concern. So I'm fine either way, but like, uh, uh, it's, it, it, I wanted it to be easier to find all these things together in the same place. That's it. Thanks. Maybe like a same BCP number going across this might make it easier as well, but we can try that out too. Very good. So Lars, uh, yes, I think, summarize here. I think what Suresh is trying to say is um, he's suggesting an update of um, 87, 13, whatever the number is, um, but basically leave all other sections unchanged and unchangeable. So so do it, do a, not a patch document, but do a full biz, but, but charter it such that nothing else can be touched other than that one section. That would also be a way forward, but we can discuss this on a list. I, I, I would suggest that you being the sponsoring AD of said working group uh, can take that as input to, uh, well. Um, good, anything else you need on this? No, this was super. I got everything good. I wanted and we'll uh, go forward with this. Thank you. Yay team. Uh, Rich, did you have a follow-up? Yeah, I just wanted to know what elegy stood for. You just wanted to? Uh, I just wanted to know what elegy stood for and apparently it's oh, eligibility. Eligibility, yes, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Well, I think we are actually ahead of schedule, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, we, well, we have five minutes left. Um, so I think the summary from that discussion is clearly, uh, at least in the room, we, you've got very good support for going forward with this working group as, you know, uh, charter with amendments and uh, tight, very tightly scoped. Um, we'll get that summarized for you and uh, get that out in the minutes. Uh, any other business in our last five minutes that we have not covered? Good, I, an actually productive uh, discussion here, thanks. Uh, I just want, right, I just want, you're leaving, right? 
I am leaving. So thanks, because you had a pretty uh, tumultuous term of things you had to cover. Uh, much appreciated. I, I do this to myself from time to time. Um, great. Well, thank you all, uh, and, and thank my co-chair for doing all of the background work that you all didn't notice that was going on in the background. Um, and we will get the summary out to the list as soon as possible, confirm all of our decisions there, and then I think in both cases forward to Lars what the conclusions of Gen Dispatch were on the two questions. Thanks.